Good to see each of you tonight. Hope that you had a good afternoon. Hope you got some rest. And uh, let's go ahead and get started with a word of prayer, and then we'll get started with our service this evening. Let's pray. Father, we ask that you'd help us this evening to have clear minds and humbled hearts as we sit under the ministry of the scriptures. I pray that you'd help us to understand the full weight of these truths and that we would uh, be committed to walking in obedience to your ways. Uh, I pray that as we share testimonies of your faithfulness and your goodness, that we would be encouraged by those things. I pray that as we sing praise to you, um, our hearts would be stirred up and challenged and that uh, you would truly be magnified tonight. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. All right. Good evening. We're going to take our hymnals tonight or look up on the screen. We're going to turn to page 368 to start off the services with a tender heart. Please stand with me. And we'll sing all three verses. Pages over to page 371. A passion for thee now. Sing two verses. All two, all both verses. Let's just put it that way. Both verses. Oh, I'm 
just a few more pages back, we're going to go to page 382. Page 382. And we're going to sing the first, second, and fourth verses of Nearer, Still Nearer. One, two, and four.
Sea Song. Oh my goodness. Ah. Let's see. Young Lady on the End. 154. One of the young men now. Nathan? Nathaniel? 130? 430. Ooh, big number. Okay, boy, girl, boy, girl. Kelly. 303 in the red book. Okay. All righty. Let me bring this thing down so that the sign ga sound guys don't get on to me. You know, a pastor would drop it about six inches in height. We'd have this thing at the same height for one another. So uh, I don't think that's going to happen. I know I'm not going to grow six inches. So, Page 154. Page 154. Amazing grace. Is that the right one? I know how to sing it. Uh, the other one, 160, 460, 147. Okay, that's a good tune. I like that tune. But if you if you want the one you're familiar with, and if you want to come up here and sing me with it, no. Okay. <laughs> All right, we'll sing the one you want. Amazing Grace, first verse. going to sing page 430 for us. Right? No? He's not listening to me. 450 or 430? 430. Lord, I need you. Sing both verses on this before the message. Stand with me. Stretch your legs out a little bit. Open up that diaphragm and sing out. Oh, 
Okay, well, if you could, let's take our Bibles together and let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, and the passage that we're looking at is verses 1 through 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 through 13. And I will confess to you at the very front of this message that the passage that we're looking at is one of the heaviest passages in all the Bible. And when I say that, I don't mean that it is an only negative passage, but it is an extremely heavy passage. And I think that if we look at this passage correctly in the way that it was meant to be understood, we will see not only the heaviness and the weight of this passage and the seriousness of this passage, but we're also going to see the hopefulness of this passage. In fact, one of the things that's very encouraging about the passage that we're looking at this evening is that next weekend, we're gonna, or next Sunday, we're going to talk about kind of a continuation of this topic that we're going to deal with tonight. And then we're going to have a third uh, passage that we're going to look at. And by the time we come to the end of this little mini-series dealing with the importance of purity in the church and this concept of church discipline, what we're going to see is that what the church did in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, their response to what God commanded them to do, actually ended up in the repentance and the restoration of the individual that was walking in very serious sin and very serious disobedience. So the passage in front of us, while very heavy and very weighty, is also a passage that's very hopeful. And in this particular situation, the one that we're looking at tonight, in the end, over a period of time, God used this action to bring an individual who was walking in a disorderly manner back into fellowship with the Lord and with the church. So with that in mind, let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 5, and we'll begin in verse number 1. In fact, actually, before we look at that, let me pick it up uh, earlier in chapter, 14, or chapter 4, verse 14, so we can kind of get the tone that leads into the instructions we find in 1 Corinthians 5. In verse 14, it says, I write not these things to shame you, but as my beloved sons, I warn you. For though ye have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet have ye not many fathers. For in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel. Wherefore I beseech you, be ye followers of me. For this cause have I sent unto you Timotheus, who is my beloved son and faithful in the Lord, who shall bring you into remembrance of my ways, which be in Christ. As I teach everywhere in every church. Now some are puffed up. As though I would not come to you, but I will come to you shortly, if the Lord will. And will know not the speech of them which are puffed up, but the power. For the kingdom of God is not word, not in word, but in power. What will ye? Shall I come to you with a rod, or in love, and in the spirit of meekness? Now, I want to just make this comment leading into the passage we're about to read. Paul is approaching this in a very personal way. He's approaching it in a very loving way. In fact, Paul does not want to have to speak as forcefully as he's going to be speaking in this passage. But Paul understands the gravity of the situation that's before him. And he understands the gravity, he understands this is a necessary way that he has to approach the church. So with that in mind, look at verse number one. This is where our text starts. He says, it is reported commonly that there is fornication among you. And such fornication as is not so much is named amongst the Gentiles, that one should have his father's wife. Ye are puffed up, and have not rather mourned that he that hath done this deed might be taken away from among you. For I verily, as absent in the body, but present in spirit, have judged already as though I were present concerning him that hath so done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when ye are gathered together, and my spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, to deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. Your glorying is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? Purge out therefore that old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened. For even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. I wrote unto you an epistle not to company with fornicators, yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world, 
or with the covetous or extortioners or with idolaters, for then must you go out of the world. But now I've written unto you not to keep company if any man that is called a brother be a fornicator or covetous or an idolater or a railer or a drunkard or an extortioner, which such a one know not to eat. For what have I to do what I, what have I to do to judge them that are without? Do ye judge them that are within? But them that are without God judgeth. Therefore therefore put away from among yourselves that wicked person. Now I think as I read these verses you can see the seriousness, the weight, the gravity of the specific situation that was being dealt with at Corinth. And by the way, this particular scenario is meant to be a case for us to understand how we're supposed to deal with matters that rise to a level that they begin to compromise really the integrity of the church or they begin to compromise, we could say, the the confidence that we have in a person's profession of faith or if a person begins to set themselves in a very rebellious manner and they're unwilling to deal with sin that rises to this level. This passage is a case that's supposed to be applied in many, many different scenarios. So in order for us to understand the the nature of the passage and the practical implications that flow out of the passage, this is going to be a very teaching-heavy kind of a sermon. We're going to spend a lot of time really looking at what Paul says, why he says it, what was the problem going on, how does he say they're supposed to approach this issue, And from looking at this passage, we're going to look at other passages that really give us instruction as to some of the details that are behind the scenes, but are most certainly being understood in the way the church was supposed to deal with this issue. So first of all, I want to begin with a summary statement, a purpose for the passage in front of us. The following section of Paul's letter to the Corinthian church reminds us, and here is the key, that God demands that his church proclaim sound doctrine and take responsibility for the conduct of those who are members in their assembly. What the passage is basically telling us is, it's not just that God wants us to speak the truth, to preach the truth, to proclaim the truth, to have a sound doctrinal statement, but he also wants us to people be people that live in the light of the truths that we say we believe, that actually, actually live in the light of these principles, these truths that God has given us in his word. In other words, the purity of the church is not just a matter of what we say, but it's also a matter of what we do. And if what we do is not consistent with what we say, then there comes a point where people, whether within the congregation or outside of the congregation, are going to look and they're going to say, you preach this, you say that we believe this, but here's what we actually do. Do we actually believe this? Is this really something we should be teaching or preaching? In other words, there's this inconsistency. There is this problem, and this problem is going to lead to ultimately compromise within the context of the church. Now, what's very interesting to me about the church at Corinth is that when Paul writes the church, and we're going to talk about some of the issues that are at work within the church, the way that Paul looks at this church is in a very compassionate way. He loves these people, even though he's going to be very forceful And he's going to be very blunt. He's going to tell them to take very serious action. He also deeply loves the church. He acknowledges that these are believers. And he believes that God is working in their midst. And that God is going to continue to work in their midst. So long as they actually submit to his lordship in these areas. For instance, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 2 he says, Unto the church of God. Clearly these are God's people. He says that are sanctified in Christ Jesus. That's a word for saying that you are set apart as holy to God. Then he says that you are called to be saints. In other words, you are positionally righteous. You are positionally set apart to God. Now live in the light of the position that you have. In verse 4 he says, I thank my God always on behalf for the grace of God which was given unto you by Jesus Christ. So even though Paul was deeply burdened, troubled and he's going to come in an extremely authoritative way to the church he still speaks of them as believers he loves them he prays for them he thanks God for the good that he sees in them and he talks about the fact that God has called them unto fellowship with his son Jesus Christ verse 9 and he's going to confirm them 
unto the end that they would be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse number 8. The point that I'm trying to make is, Paul does not look at this as a church that is on the side and of no value to him. He doesn't look at these people as a burden. He loves them, and it's because he loves them that he addresses this issue in the way that he does. What God wants us to see from this passage is that we are responsible as a church to submit to his authority through obedience to his commands regarding this issue of church discipline. Church discipline is really about the church being a holy congregation. Let me begin with this introduction. God calls us to walk in holiness. Let me give you a couple of examples of scriptures that we all are aware of that I think undergird what we're going to talk about tonight. First of all, in 1 Peter 1 it says, Gird up the loins of your mind. Be sober. Hope unto the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lust in your ignorance, as he which hath called you is holy, be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Matthew 5.13 tells us that we are the salt of the earth. Matthew 5.14 says you are the light of the world. He says, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. God calls us to be holy individuals. He calls us to be a holy assembly, congregation, local church. So with that in the forefront of this discussion, let's begin by understanding the details of the case that's before us. The first question I want to ask this evening is what was going on in the church at Corinth? What was the problem? In fact, there will be a day, I don't know when this will happen, that I will actually preach verse by verse through the book of 1 Corinthians. And I will probably not do it on Sunday morning because that would be a very weighty uh, Sunday morning message week after week after week, month after month after month. But this is a really important book. It's important for us to understand that even within a local church that preaches Christ, there are real transformed people in that church. Their lives have been radically changed by the gospel. Even within that context, it is possible for all kinds of serious, dark, sinful behaviors to begin to take root in the hearts of people. Now, it's important for us to understand the context of the people that came to faith in Christ at Corinth. Corinth was a wicked city. Corinth was a very, very dark city. And so because of the darkness and because of the backgrounds that some of these people came from, it was very easy for them, though they had accepted the gospel, their lives were being changed by the power of the gospel, that there would be certain areas in their life that became sticking points that they struggled in, maybe that they refused to address. There were areas that Paul had to draw the attention of the leadership of the church to so that they would deal with these issues. Let me give you some examples of some of the things that Paul addressed in this letter to the church at Corinth. And by the way, this is one of two epistles that are scripture, and we know that Paul also wrote additional uh, epistles that were not scripture, but they bore his authority as he answered questions, as he addressed issues that were going on at the church of Corinth. First of all, we see that they tolerated the shameful, shameful pagan practices. Listen to what it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 15. He says, Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them the members of an harlot? God forbid. Question. Is it possible for people in a believing church to get involved in prostitution? The answer is, yep. Happened here. It was something that was going on in the church. And Paul said, you cannot have anything to do with these shameful practices. So he addresses the issue. A second area is that they tolerated sexual perversions. 1 Corinthians 5.1, it says, it is reported commonly, this is in our text, that there is fornication among you and such fornication as, as is not so much named amongst the Gentiles. 
Now, I would not encourage you to spend a lot of time reading about the kind of perversions that took place at that time in the Roman Empire. But sometimes, when you are studying a passage of Scripture to understand the weight of what he's saying, you need to be aware of the cultural context. When Paul states that the kind of sexual sin that the church was aware of and unwilling to address, and this individual was being very proud and arrogant about this sin, was something that even within a very debased culture, they looked at it and said, this is not acceptable at all. I remember when we lived in Ghana, there was an individual who was involved in something that was very, very serious. And I remember having to discuss this matter with some of the men who are in the leadership of our church. And I can remember that when I shared with them, this is the nature of what we're dealing with, this is the nature of this situation, the way that they looked at it, and this is a society where polygamy was common, accepted in certain aspects of the society, they said, what that man's done is an abomination. It was their way of saying, this isn't just bad, this is really bad. This is really offensive. This is unacceptable even amongst non-Christians. That is the nature of what the church was accepting or allowing and unwilling to address. A third area, they tolerated abusive behavior. Now, when I say abusive behavior, they were using the legal system to basically destroy people's reputations so that they could take advantage of them. This was an extremely common practice in Corinth at the time that the church was planted. In 1 Corinthians 6, 1, it says, Dare any of you, ta having a matter against another, go to law before the unjust and not before the saints? Do ye not know that the saints shall judge the world, and if the world shall be judged by you, are ye, not, are, are ye unworthy to judge the smallest matters? So in other words, there were disputes amongst people, disputes that were completely able to be resolved between brothers in Christ. It wasn't the kind of thing that rose to the level of criminal behavior. These are, these are spats. These are people not getting along with one another. And rather than handling it in a godly way, in a way that resolved their differences in a redemptive manner, in a manner that led to restoration, these people were immediately taking these things into the law courts and they were trying to destroy a brother in Christ and they were using the arm of the law to do such a thing. And they were tolerating this behavior. A fourth area is they tolerated a corrupting of the sacred. 1 Corinthians 11 verse 18 it says, when ye come together in the church, I hear that there be divisions among you, and I partly believe it. When ye come together, therefore, into one place, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper. For in eating, everyone taketh before others his own supper, and one is hungry, and another is drunk, and despise ye the church of God, and shame them that have not. In other words, the Lord's table, which was supposed to be a time that demonstrated humility, the connection, the bond that we have in Christ as brothers and sisters in Christ, a time of unity, a time of fellowship, a time that is sacred, a time that is holy. People were getting drunk at the Lord's table. People were separating out the poor from the rich. They essentially turned it into a pagan festive occasion. And Paul said, this should never be a part of the church. The point is, the church of Corinth had major problems. And these problems had to be addressed. This church could not overlook these matters and continue to experience God's blessing, continue to, continue to experience his power, and see him work through them the way that he desired to. They were in eminent danger as a church. Let me give you a couple of ways they're in danger. First of all, professing Christians were emboldened in their sinful practices. The fact is, when someone is doing something that is sinful, and it rises to a level that needs to be addressed, and it's not addressed, guess what happens? They become calloused. They become cold. They become hardened. Perhaps it is addressed, but it's not addressed thoroughly. In other words, someone addresses it kind of a little bit, and then they kind of back off and they leave it alone. What happens? The person becomes emboldened. That was the sense of what was taking place in the church at Corinth. Professing Christians were emboldened in their, sh their sinful practices. 
He says in verse 18 of chapter 4, some are puffed up as though I would not come to you. It's like they were saying, Paul isn't going to come and talk to us about this. You guys don't need to worry about this. Paul is over there. We're over here. We don't have to worry about him, this authoritative apostle. We don't have to worry about him. There was pride. The church's testimony in the community was in question. When he says in 1 Corinthians 5, 2, he says this kind of fornication that is openly reported is not even named amongst the Gentiles. It's his way of saying the church is being compromised in their community because they won't deal with the sin. They preach a gospel of grace where the sins of people are dealt with at the cross and they are transformed by the power of the gospel, but they're living in a way that's not even acceptable to pagans. This destroys the church's testimony. Three, the sins, were, were that the sins they were tolerating were spreading in the church and causing destruction to the unity and purity of the body. It's very interesting what he says in verses 6 and 7. He says that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. The idea is that if you don't deal with this issue here, there's going to be a day that that issue creates an issue here, and it creates an issue here, and it creates an issue here, and before long, the entire church is full of an issue that you cannot deal with without very, very harsh and troubling action. It will spread. It will grow. But the last thing that I think is perhaps the most sobering is that the church was in danger of high-handed disobedience to Christ. The church is under the authority of Christ. And I want you to notice the way that Paul speaks to the church about their duty to deal with the matter in front of them. He says, I verily as absent in body but present in spirit have judged already as though I were present concerning him that hath so done this deed. Now listen carefully to the next statement. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when ye are gathered together and my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ Deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of our Lord Jesus. Do you not see the sense of earnestness and connected to Christ's authority? In other words, Jesus, who is the Lord of the church, says, you must take such action because it is through this action that I'm going to deliver this person from the bondage of their sin. I'm going to restore them so that one day when they stand before me, they will be saved from harsh judgment that would accompany this sin not being dealt with, restoration not taking place. So Christ says, do this under my authority. Notice he says, when you are gathered together. That little statement is something that is going to come up again in another passage in just a moment. Don't forget that statement. The second question is, how was the congregation to respond to this unrepentant sin in the body? First of all, they needed to be willing to confront the matter in a godly way. Now, before we look at the way that they were supposed to confront the matter, I want to talk to you for just a moment, not in great detail, but about some sinful ways to respond to sin when we're aware of it within a church context. When I say sinful, sometimes we don't want to call it sinful. We'll just say, well, you know, I didn't quite, we didn't follow through with it. We fell short of what we were supposed to do. But the word sin means missing the mark. What God tells us to do, the, the way he tells us to do things, we're not doing it in that way. We're responding in a sinful manner. Here's what he says. Or here, here are some, some ways that we can respond in a sinful manner. And the reason I bring them up is because they're common. They're easy. They're the way that we are most inclined, if it wasn't for the authority of Scripture and the Word of God and the Holy Spirit pressing us, this is the way we would tend to deal with issues of sin. The first is to ask, act as if it doesn't exist. I don't see it. I just ignore it. This is a very common thing that, that people do. Okay, I saw that and I go, you know what, forget it. I, I don't, I don't want to think about that anymore. And then it happens again. I don't want to think about it. It happens again. And again, and again, and they just ignore it. This is a very 
common response in church contexts. It's also a very sinful response. A second sinful response is adjusting what we teach to allow the sinful practice to continue without being confronted. So this kind of accommodation is actually something that's becoming very common within our culture today. There are certain sinful practices that historically Christians have always called sinful practices. They're not to be tolerated. They're not to be indulged in. They're not to be ignored. Yet the church has come to a place where rather than calling it what it is and condemning it as sin, instead they've adjusted the teaching to say, hey, you know, maybe what Paul actually meant by this particular thing was this. So maybe we can accommodate such behavior. Folks, adjusting the teaching of the church ultimately is going to lead to the destruction and the fall of that assembly. A third sinful response is to take steps to cover the sin. And this is what happens many times. In a church context where you have a person who is very influential, very well liked, maybe they have a lot of money, their family has been a member of the church for decades and decades and decades, and rather than dealing with the sin, the church, those who are aware of it, will cover it and move the person to a different location so they don't have to deal with it. And they'll say, you know, God forgives and God forgets. Go to a new place and get a fresh start. And I'm sure you won't deal with this ever again. And you know what happens when they go to a new place? They do the same thing. Just this week, I was meeting with some missionaries. And we were talking about some serious matters. And they talked about this exact scenario. There was a man who was in leadership at a church in the States. He was involved in very sinful, might even add illegal, activity. And you know how the church handled it? Instead of them dealing with it the way that they ought, confronting it as sin, dealing with it through the legal means because it was illegal and abusive and very dangerous, instead what they did is they covered the matter and they sent him to be a missionary in the Caribbean. Guess what he did in the Caribbean? The same thing. Over and over and over again. I hate to say this, but this is true. There are churches that have a sound doctrinal statement, but they do this. And the church of God cannot act in such a way. A fourth Talking about the sin to people privately who have nothing to do with it. Now, <clears throat> I, I experienced this as a missionary because as a missionary, you're kind of an outsider in the context where you're working. And I would sometimes, I didn't laugh because it was funny, but I would go, it's so interesting how I'm the last person in the church to find out this or that. In other words, by the time it finally got to my attention, everybody was aware of the issue. Well, sadly to say, that is what happens in a context where rather than people being proactive, rather than people being principled, rather than people taking steps in love that might be difficult, they talk about an issue to those that have no power, no authority to actually deal with the matter. That's what gossip is. In fact, sometimes people will even get a little bit of a sense of thrill out of the tidbits that they're aware of. And what does that do? It has the exact same effect as overlooking. It has the exact same effect as cover. It has the exact same effect in principle as one who changes what they teach to accommodate what's going on. It does not deal with the problem. When Paul is writing to the church at Corinth, the church was fully aware of the matter before him. It was an elephant in the room, and he had to address it because rather than people dealing with it in a biblical way, they talked about it and left it there. A fourth, talking about the sin publicly in a cowardly manner without directly addressing it. Now, this is a temptation that pastors have. This is a temptation that someone who is in a position where they have, we could say, a sounding board to talk about things can do this. They don't want to have a confrontation they don't want to get into the nitty-gritty of an issue. 
They don't want to go through the process. So rather than confronting it the way that it should, one-on-one, in love, to, to, to seek to restore, they use the pulpit as a bully pulpit. And they talk about the issue, and everybody's sitting there going, oh, I know who he's talking about. <laughs> the person who's there kind of, I know who he's talking about, that's me. And they don't deal with the issue. That's a very cowardly manner, a way to handle a situation. We can use it in the pulpit. We can use it on social media. We can use it by talking to another person to get them upset so that they are our sounding board. But the bottom line is, it does not deal with the sin in a godly way. Well, obviously, this is pointing to the fact that we need to be responsible and we need to confront a matter when it's before us. But even in the response of confrontation, we can still sin. Because it is possible for us to be proactive and to take the steps that are necessary and commanded, but to do it in an ungodly way. We can do it in a proud way. We can do it in an irresponsible way. We can do it in a, in a way that is hoping to see a certain end. And so when we look at these various ways, what we will see is in what the scriptures tell us about how to deal with these situations, none of those things are the way the Bible tells us to deal with sin in the context of the church. So let me mention to you a godly approach under normal circumstances. There should always be within the church a culture of restoration and spiritual maturity. Now next week, Lord willing, what I'm planning to do is talk about how a church develops a culture of restoration and spiritual maturity. This is something that we need in the DNA, in the fabric of our congregation. In fact, if that is in the DNA and fabric of a congregation, the times where a church has to address an issue in the way that we see in this passage is going to be few and far between. Does it mean it never happens? But it doesn't have to happen often because when there is sin, it's being dealt with on a very private level. It's being resolved in a godly way and people are maturing through these processes. Galatians 6, 1 to 3, here's what it says. If a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of meekness. Bear ye one another's burdens, so fulfill the law of Christ. If a man thinks himself to be anything, when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. I'm not going to dig into this passage tonight for sake of time, but next week we're going to dig into the details of this. But notice the statement, you who are spiritual, restore in a spirit of meekness. Consider yourself. Bear one another's burdens. Don't think of yourself higher than you ought to think. Those are the senses of the way that this process is to unfold. In Matthew 18, verses 15 through 20, we see the exact same sense. He says, If thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. It doesn't say go to his brother or go to his sister or go to his wife or go to his friend or go to his deacon or go to him and talk to the individual one-on-one, -on -one, in private, desiring to see a restoration. And it may very well be that that conversation resolves the issue without any issue. But it's also possible it doesn't. He says, if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. Now I'm going to make some comments about this in a moment, but notice it is necessary at times to not handle that conversation alone but to have to go to an additional conversation or additional conversations with other individuals who are godly, who are wise, who are balanced to witness what is going on and to also bring balance to the way that the issue is approached. It's also possible in such situations, though, that it doesn't resolve the problem. You say, well, I thought Christians resolve their issues. They're supposed to, but that doesn't mean that they do. Is there anybody in this room that has not been in a situation where you were in the wrong and it was brought to your attention and you did not admit it and you fought it and you fought it and you fought it and it took God doing something in a circumstance to finally get your attention and then you were humbled and you, you kind of went back and got the issue right? Everybody here has been in that place. 
So it is possible that even the one-on-one conversation does not prove to be productive. It is possible that even in the context of two or three individuals that are sitting down trying to work through this issue, it doesn't get resolved. So what are you to do in such a situation? It says, if he neglect to hear them, tell it to the church. You say, the church? The church. You say, why is that? Because we are a body that is connected together that is supposed to strengthen and help and encourage one another. You say, well, I thought it was supposed to stay private. It was. (laughs) That was the desire. That was the intent. And this is not the first step. This is where you go when those other issues do not resolve the matter. He then goes on to say, if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as an heathen man and a publican. He then goes on later to say, again, I say unto you, if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my father, which is in heaven, where two or three are gathered together in my name. There am I in the midst. Now, I know it is very common That when we hear this phrase, where two or three are gathered together in my name, I'm in the midst. And we tend to think of that in a prayer situation. Because we are agreed on this matter, then God is going to work through that matter and we take comfort in that. But I want you to notice that that statement is not made in the area of praying for your friend who has a health matter or some other issue. It is actually given in the context of people who are trying to restore a brother who is in sin and unrepentant. And you'll notice that it is through the agreement of those individuals who have the facts and understand the issue and have tried to work through the matter, it is through that that God moves and works and even takes action on his part. By the way, what we will see in this passage is that God will deal with the individual once the church takes such an action the question is will God deal with them if the church does not take the action and the answer is I don't know but what we do know is that the scripture tells us that if a church takes an action in an appropriate manner with a necessary scenario God will act because of that statement the next thing I see is that a godly response when a sinning brother refuses to face his sin in godly repentance Public action has to be taken to remove an unrepentant brother from the congregation in such a situation. Notice the details of this passage so we can see what he's saying. And I'm going to also draw a couple of other passages into this one so we'll understand it. The first thing we see is that he he says we are to withdraw from Christian fellowship when a brother is in such a state. In verses 3 to 5, he says, Deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh. With such an one, do not eat. Put away from you among yourselves that wicked person. Now, when he talks about not eating with this person, I'm not convinced that he's saying, don't get a coffee with them. What he's saying is, do not affirm their position in Christ by allowing them to take the Lord's table and allowing them to be a part of the congregation, the assembly of the local church. In other words, while you are not saying you know a person is an unbeliever, you are recognizing by the way that they're responding in sin to this entire situation that they are not acting as a believer. And so we remove from them the affirmation of their 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 position not saying we know that they're lost but we remove that affirmation and also the benefits of the blessings that come with being assembled as a local church we also anticipate that God is going to chasten that individual in that situation in another passage second Thessalonians 3 6 he says we command you brethren in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ that you withdraw yourself from every brother that walketh disorderly not after the traditions which you have received of us. We see the same kind of statement in Romans 16 where he says, Mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned and avoid them. I hope you see that the Bible is very clear about these matters. This moves us to a third question. 
What were the distinguishing marks of this confrontation? Well, the sins that were addressed were the kinds of sins that bring one's profession into question. He says, if any man that is called a brother. In fact, it's very interesting. He says, we do not relate to someone who professes to be a Christian and is in these kinds of sins the same way that we, that we re relate to someone who does not profess to be a believer who's in the exact same sins. So if a man is fornicating and he says, I'm a believer, and a man never claims to be a believer and he's fornicating, he says, you don't relate to these two people the same way. Because this person claims the name of Christ, this person doesn't. I'm not surprised when this person is living in such a way. He doesn't have the Holy Spirit. He's not a new creature in Christ. He's never embraced the gospel. But this guy, this woman, being a believer, claiming to be a Christian, living in such a way, that does surprise me. That does bring questions. That is the sense of what he's saying. Secondly, they were verifiably living in an established way of life. He's not saying that a person committed fornication, you went and dealt with the issue, they were repentant about it, they were humbled about it, they were seeking help in this issue, and then you say, oh, by the way, because you did this, we're going to go ahead and excommunicate you. That's not the sense. The sense is you have a person that is a fornicator, and they are continually involved in this behavior. When they're confronted, there is a lack of sensitivity, a lack of humility, a lack of willingness to take the steps that are necessary to resolve the issue. And he mentions very specific issues. He mentions fornication, a pattern of sexual sin, covetousness, a pattern of discontentment and greed, an idolater, a pattern of someone embracing false doctrine, a railer, a pattern that is characterized by verbal abuse, and an aggressiveness destroying people with your words. A drunkard, a behavior of someone, a pattern of someone who is characterized by being intoxicated. An extortioner, a person who has a pattern where they use their position to take advantage of others. They deceive, they manipulate so that they can get advantage. That is the sense of someone who is an extortioner. So when Paul talks about these sins, he's not suggesting that a believer can't find themselves in these matters. Or that every believer who in, is involved in these sinful practices immediately should be disciplined out of the church. It's a believer, someone claiming to be a Christian, who has this pattern established. They're not dealing with the matter. There is a callousness, there's a hardness, there's a lack of repentance. There's an unwillingness to take responsibility and deal with the matter in a godly way. And we also see that it brings destruction and disruption to the body. In Paul's mind, if they didn't deal with this matter, it would compromise the church. So I have a fourth question. And by the way, there's not too many more. Don't worry, we're kind of coming to the end here. <laughs> fourth question. How should this process look when such sin becomes known? What I'd like to do is I'd like to just kind of walk through so that we understand kind of what all these truths put together, these passages put together, look like in a very practical way. For instance, a person becomes aware that there's a matter that is serious enough to warrant a loving yet firm confrontation. Now, listen, not every sin that we see warrants a loving confrontation. You know, there are times that, we, that you know, we're dealing with our kids and we see that they, there's certain behavior that they're involved in and we go, you know, that person's being immature. I've addressed this. They're not being rebellious. They're not being calloused. It's an area of learning. So it's not like every single matter rises to such a level that it has to be dealt with. We're not here to nitpick with one another. But there are times that you can see a matter that you know is very serious. And it can't be overlooked. It has to be addressed. It's the nature of the kinds of things that he's talked about. Scripture talks about very specific matters. We've already mentioned some of them. Well, in such a situation, what is your responsibility? Your responsibility is not to overlook. It's not to talk about it behind the scenes. It's not to be angry and just ignore it. It's to go and talk to that person. It's to talk to them in love. It's to talk to them in humility. And it's to look at your own heart first to make sure that the way that you're going about it is consistent with the way God would have you to address the matter. In other words, we must, in such a case, approach this confrontation 
in a humble, Christ-like way. Nobody in this room is above many of the very sins sometimes we have to address. We are all made of the same stuff. We all need accountability. We all are saved by the grace of God alone. It is the grace of God that sustains us and keeps us walking in his ways. And so when we are duty bound to take that step, we are duty bound to take the step in humility and in a godly manner. Number three, we must seek to address the issue privately, face to face, hoping to limit the danger done by the sin and making a repentance response as easy as possible. The point of this conversation is not because you want to take more people to talk to this person. It's not because you want to go to the church with this matter. It's not because you want it to be a well-known problem. You want to deal with it privately. You want it to be contained. You want to make it as easy as possible to remove the hindrances, the stumbling blocks to an individual saying, it's true, this is wrong. I want to take steps to deal with this sin. That's extremely important. Uh, next, if, if the person has taken this step and realizes that the one sinning is unwilling to address the issue biblically, rather than letting the matter go, they must approach two or three godly individuals who will help in the next level of the confrontation. Now, it is very easy for us in such a situation to go, you know, I did my duty. I said my piece. I'll just leave it there and just let God deal with this individual. But my question is this. Is the matter resolved? The answer is no. So we are not just responsible to have the first step, but we are also responsible to take the second step. And these individuals are to act as a check and balance to the process, as witnesses to verify the details, as grifted Christians who will bring balance to the confrontation. Within our congregation, we have some people that are very justice-oriented, what I mean by that is you see things very black and very white, and there are very few gray areas. You say, well, why, do you, why is it that people are like that? Because that's just that's the way that they're wired. You have other people that, while they can see problems, they tend to be very compassionate, very slow. You have some people that are very decisive. You have some people that are very slow. And if you have only slow people, things never get dealt with. If you have people that are very aggressive, things get dealt with too quickly. If you have people that are very harsh, someone doesn't have the opportunity to respond the way that they should and the way that you desire them to. But if everybody is mercy, 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 and there's never actually a point where there's a line in the sand, you say, you can't cross this line. There has to be a point where all of these different approaches because of the different wirings and the different giftedness of these godly people, comes together to provide balance to this kind of a scenario. It is important that when the next step is taken, that is a part of the process. Next, if the sinning brother refuses to respond in godly repentance, then they must take the matter to the church where the brother should be removed from the congregation's fellowship. You say, that seems so harsh. You know, it does. It's a very difficult thing to say, I need to take such an action, or we need to take such an action. However, it's what God commands us to do. There does come a point where that is the only appropriate way to deal with a matter of sin. So I ask this next question. What should the church anticipate when that happens? What, do you, what, is the, what should the church expect God to do when they take an action in obedience and soberly to God like this? Well, there are three possible outcomes I want to mention. The first is that the person walks away without any visible discipline from God. You say, can that happen? Yes, of course it can happen. Think about 1 John. He says there were people that went out from us because they were not of us. And if they had been of us, they would not have gone out from us. The point that he's making is there are some people, they were part of the congregation, they went out and nothing happened. They just continued on their merry way like nothing had taken place. <coughs> this outcome reminds the church that there are times that people come into the congregation whose true identity is not what they profess it to be. God chastens his children. 
The second potential outcome is that they experience intense, visible hardship that brings them to their senses where godly sorrow leads to lasting repentance. And the kind of restoration that only God can bring through the power of the gospel. This outcome reminds the church that the, whom the Lord loves, he chastens that, he might, that, that we might be partakers of his holiness. In other words, while one person can leave the congregation and go on their merry way and God doesn't touch them, another person who is in the same position, they have the same attitude, they go out of the church and God deals with them very, very firmly. And guess what happens? That person... When it happens, knows for a fact whom the Lord loves, he chastens. The congregation who has taken this action, when they see that happen, they say, whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. In fact, in many ways, that becomes one of the great verifiers. That person belongs to the Lord. God did not let them go. And God will bring that person to humility repentance, and restoration. By the way, that's exactly what happened in the church of Corinth. But there is a third possibility. And that is that a person experiences intense visible hardships that can even lead to death. And this outcome sobers the church to see how dangerous it is to mock God and his word in his church. In fact, when we look at 1 Corinthians, it is true that this particular brother became repentant and was restored. It is also true that there were other people in the congregation that when they mocked the Lord's table, you know what happened? They died. Do you remember the story of Ananias and Sapphira? They came and they lied to the apostles. They lied to the church. And they dropped dead just like that. And the fact is that there are times that God deals in that way. I want you to realize that we talk about this kind of an issue. This is an extremely sobering, sobering warning. Paul loves the church, yet he warns them that it is very important that they walk soberly before the Lord. He warns those who are walking in a disorderly manner that if they don't take seriously the actions that have been taken to resolve matters, they will answer directly to God. The final question I ask is, how should we respond to this pattern laid out for the church at Corinth? Let me give you a couple of simple thoughts just in closing. First, we must have a passion to walk in holiness. We should all walk in a very sober manner. Two, we must cultivate a humble culture of continual renewal in the church. We should have the kinds of relationships with one another where we edify one another, we encourage one another. When a brother or sister is beginning to move in a direction that they shouldn't, there are godly people that love them, they have a close enough relationship with them that they can speak the truth into that person's life and they get back on course. And the issue is resolved very quickly, very smoothly. It never gets even close to the level we're talking about. Thirdly, we need godly people who submit to Christ in this very difficult duty. It is not easy to go and talk to someone who is not wanting to talk to you. It's not easy. It's not easy to approach someone who you feel may very well not respond in a humble way. They may lash out in anger. They may cause you to be seen as the problem, not them. That is a hard thing for people to do. But the reality is, as individuals within the congregation, we need to be godly enough to be willing to submit to Christ and take steps toward restoration that God commands us to take. Four, we need to be committed to a godly rather than sinful response to sin in the church. Nobody should be surprised when a brother sins. Nobody. Nobody should be surprised. But we also should always take restorative steps to resolve issues in a godly way. Lastly, we need to be growing in Christian virtue so that these kinds of confrontations are very, very rare because they're unnecessary. There's a difference between something being rare because we ignore. Rare because it's not needed. Because people really are growing. Because people really are having these kinds of conversations. 
Because when there's a need for restoration, it happens on level one or two. It never has to get to level three. God wants the church to be a healthy, vibrant culture where these kinds of situations are very rare. The reason that Corinth was in such a place is because they let a lot of things go for a long time. And so it's so very important that we are a church that is obedient to Christ in these areas. Next week, Lord willing, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about having a culture that encourages these kinds of relationships. The following week, my plan is for us to talk about what restoration looks like. What does godly repentance look like? How does a church restore a brother or a sister who has fallen and is outside of the church and desiring to be restored? So that's where we're going with these passages. I want to encourage you, we must be people that submit to the authority of Christ because this is his church. Let's bow together in prayer and ask the Lord to help us to be like that. Father in heaven, we ask that you'd help us to be very sobered by the scriptures in front of us. I know this is a long sermon. I know there are a lot of details, but this is a very weighty matter. I pray that you'd help us to, to be the kinds of people that are willing to obey you and walk with you. Father, help us to love brothers and sisters in Christ even when they are stumbling. Help us to be willing to speak with them. Help us to be willing to walk with them through their struggles. Father, I pray that you'd help us as a congregation when we as individuals fall into such places because we have been lazy or because we have been covering our sin, whatever the scenario, I pray that you would soften our hearts when these confrontations come so that we might be humbled in a godly manner and restored in a godly manner. Father, help us to be a holy church that walks in obedience to your will. We ask it in Christ's name, amen. Okay, if you could, let's take our, our hymn books out and let's sing our closing hymn, hymn 390. It is I Surrender All, 390, I Surrender All. We're gonna sing the first and the fourth verses, please, of the hymn. Let's stand together. All to Jesus I surrender all to him I freely give. I will ever love and trust him in his presence daily live. I surrender all. I surrender all. All to thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender the last all to jesus i surrender lord i give myself to thee fill me with thy love and power let thy blessings fall on me i surrender all i surrender Savior, I surrender all. Okay, we're going to have a, a, a brief business meeting after our closing prayer, and obviously it's connected to what I've preached tonight. Uh, so let's close in prayer. Um, it's, a, it's only a, a member's meeting, uh, so if you're visiting, um, we're going to ask that you be dismissed for this uh, conversation uh, because it will be sensitive in nature. Um, but uh, I want to ask you to um, if you need to get a drink, use the restroom, fine, and then we'll come back and um, we'll, we'll go from there. So let's bow together for a word of prayer and then uh, we'll be dismissed for a short, a short break before we come back. Father, I pray that you'd help us to, to be very sobered by these truths. Father, help us more than anything to recognize um, that we are sinful people that can very easily end up in places that are very dark and very serious. And I pray that when we get in those places, we would have loving brothers and sisters who come alongside of us and speak the truth to us. Father, help us to be humbled when they do that. Help us to be willing to be those kinds of brothers and sisters when we are called upon to do that. I pray that you'd help us as we have a meeting here in a few moments that 
uh, our our attitude towards the issue that we need to address would would be in the spirit of this passage and that you would work through it to bring a restoration to a brother who right now is stumbling in darkness. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen.